You are tuned in to the FoxCast podcast, the one and only podcast devoted strictly to Ford-powered Fox bodies. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the FoxCast podcast. We are on location in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and I have got two extremely special guests with me today. We are inside out of the rain waiting for them to dry the track off and uh, took an awesome opportunity to meet two icons of the Mustang industry. The first is editor Steve Turner from uh, 5 Mustang Magazine previously. Um, Steve has now moved on to SVT Performance and um, you know comes all the way from Florida up to Bowling Green to check out the action, cover the action. Um, we also have KJ Jones here with us today which is also from 5 Mustang and Super Ford Magazine fame. Um, KJ has also moved on as well. Uh, he's with Diesel Performance. So, what's up, guys? How's everything going? Hey, Caleb. How are you? Doing Good. great. Thanks for having us. Wanted to really, really thank you guys for uh, giving me this opportunity and, and giving the fans opportunity just to kind of pick your brain, get inside your head about, um, you know, what it's like on the other side of, of the magazine and, and to see all the awesome parts and the awesome cars and um uh, all the new products, all all the fantastic things that we read about and love in the magazine um, that you guys bring to light. So, um, you know, that's what I really wanted to get into first. I mean, y- y- if you think about it, you know, a Ford guy or a car guy in general, you know, their their dream job, I would assume, would probably be a uh, you know working with a magazine. So, Steve, talk a little bit about that. Well, I got my start in in magazines kind of that way. You know, I was a reader of magazines and a, a fan of Mustangs and, you know, got really into the five liter scene and followed it, you know, very, very closely. And I was in college and uh, I needed to do an internship to complete my college. So I just was reading Super Ford Magazine one day and I was like, hey, these guys are pretty close to where I am. So uh, I, you know, called them up and said, hey, could you guys use an intern? And they surprisingly said yes. So I went down for the summer and, you know, I, like you're saying, you know, you're a car guy and you get in behind that. And, you know, I thought it was the coolest thing ever, that, but I thought it was only going to be for that summer, you know. And I, I was just telling KJ last night, you know, one of the things that I got to do while I was there, you know, I had to do a lot of busy work as an intern, but they started to let me do, you know, write stories. And then one day they, they got back from the 5-0 shootout and they had all the photos and they let me sort them. And I just thought that was the greatest <laughs> Greatest thing ever because oh, yeah. I've been following these cars, you know, from the outside. And, uh, you know, it just worked out that, you know, I completed college and they called me up and said, hey, you want a job? And, you know, the rest is history. The rest is like Absolutely. History. And you were there from 99 to 14, is that correct? I, on 5.0, I was from 99 to 14. But previous to that, I started in 1994 on Super Ford magazine. Super so. Ford, back in the days of the GT40 intakes yeah. and the whale tails, yeah. Oh, yeah. the good old days. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, KJ, tell us a little bit about your experience. Um, I have a, a road that's a little longer traveled, Caleb, um, a car guy since birth. Uh, Steve knows the, 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 the mom's funny story. Yeah. Uh, he had a, a, a visit with my mom, and she shared with him that uh, I used to sleep with my Hot Wheels cars. <laughs> 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 so... Um, from day one, a car guy, and I guess, you know, as you go on in life, you kind of figure that you'd like to do something in the automotive industry, and um, I say it's a, a longer travel because I went to college, and upon graduating from college as a communications uh, communications graduate, I didn't jump right into magazine or anything like that. I went into broadcast. I was with uh, radio broadcast first with CBS News, and then on the television side for many years, and then um, got into internet news for for quite a while and uh, elected to finally pursue my, my passion of automotive. So I uh, made a transition um, into uh, automotive through dealership and then uh, the internet started bringing itself to light and through Mustang forums and finding like-minded you know people and friends and stuff and communicating with them online um, and becoming somewhat of, a, of an answer person because I, uh, let me go back, I got into Mustangs of course. Um, and immersed myself in them because I thought they were really cool cars and the performance and, and all that type of stuff. So um, when the internet came on and people asking questions about the cars and that type of thing and answering to the best of my knowledge based on what I've experienced or what I could find out, uh, I guess I 
acquired a talent for you know knowing about them and being able to communicate about them. So um, from there, uh, opportunities came up to freelance write, and uh, and from the freelance, it, it eventually turned into a job at Five O. That is amazing, awesome story. And you know, I, I I was a subscriber for probably as long as Five O was out there. Um, I actually subscribed to another one before, and once Five O kind of came on the scene in '99. There was just something about it that just seemed a little more, um, not quite as full of advertising. You know, it was more about the cars. Um, and most of the the guys that I talked to that I used to hang out with, you know, kind of felt the same way. Five O kind of took over. Um, you know, always loved the articles, the features. Um, they just seemed a little more realistic as far as the, the car goes. They weren't such a pie in the sky type of thing. Um, so huge fan of the magazine. Um, so obviously, um, Steve, you've moved on to SVT performance. How's everything going over there? It's going great. It's a, <clears throat> it's a bit more frenetic pace than it was in the magazine world. You know, we had a more structured, you know, get out a magazine every month and, and now it's uh, get something up every day. So it's, uh, it keeps me very busy, but it's been pretty exciting to, you know, to build something up and obviously still stay in the Ford world and be able to, you know, talk about these cars that I love and, you know, do my thing. It's been cool. So KJ, how about diesel performance? What's going on? Diesel power. It's, it's, I'm sorry. It's, okay. <laughs> it's, okay. it's, it's diesel power. And uh, I've been on diesel power now for a little more than a year. And uh, it's actually been going well. Of course, when I uh, got the job at diesel power, it was somewhat of a, I guess you could say a surprise or a shock even to the Mustang scene where, you know, a guy who's been uh, the senior tech editor of 5.0 for many years and um, for all intents and purposes, just, you know, Mustangs are what he does to say, you know, I'm transitioning to something that um, beyond having a, a, a tow vehicle that's a diesel, what does he know about him, et cetera. But uh, the opportunity came up to to lead a magazine and to you know be the editor and, and actually learn something new. So uh, I had to go for it. It's been really good. It's It's been uh, interesting. Definitely challenging, but um, something that I've shared with Steve many times is that uh, I guess even subliminally, subliminally, through through just watching what he does, he never sat down and said, "This is what you do to be an editor." But um, through the moves that he made with Five O, and I guess my own paying attention to them, I've been able to apply a lot of that to the diesel power administrator side and operation side, and it's been going very well. That's awesome. I mean, but you think about it. I mean, who doesn't love a diesel truck? You know, it's <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, they're kind of um, they're not something that's mutually exclusive. So yeah, I mean, right. I totally, totally get what you're saying. So um, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, both of you guys have very popular and uh, extremely cool uh, Fox bodies that that we got to kind of see build um, throughout the life of Five O Magazine. And Steve, yours is the Fox 500. Give us some details on the Fox 500. Well, that was a, a crazy plan that I hatched when I, I came across a, a T-top hatch, which, uh, you know, I'd never really seen one of those in person. I, you know, I, I'd always, you know, of, of an aero nose era, I'd always seen the earlier, you know, four-eyed T-top cars. And I was just like, well, you know, once I figured out it was real, I was like, I got to have this thing. And then once I had it, I was like, kind of cool to do something different you know everyone you know I could put you know heads in cam and do all that stuff it'd be really fun to do something different and at the time the GT500 had had just come out and it has this big 5.4 supercharged engine I was like well, you know, wouldn't it be cool to you know kind of fuse these two eras together and as you might imagine it wasn't as easy as, as, as just <laughs> doing that um, you know fortunately we were able to partner up with Paul's High Performance up in Michigan had a lot of experience you know they had put they had built a car that had a Ford GT engine in it and, oh wow uh, um, so they had a lot of experience with the engine swap stuff and uh, Ford Performance Racing Parts was just coming out with their uh, control packs you know they're very very popular with the sure. Coyote engines now but the GT500 one was one of the first ones that they developed and my car sort of became a test bed for that project they they basically took a GT500 processor and kind of took out some of the programming to make it work. And, oh, wow. and you know, that was sort of the, the beginnings of those. So it, uh, it, it took a lot of cut. There's a lot of custom work in that car. You know, it has, you know, GT500 front brakes. You know, they had to modify SN95 spindles to fit the front brakes. You know, it's got a T56. It's, you know, that full maximum 
uh, suspension on it. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to it. <laughs> I can imagine. So what is it like driving a car like that? It's a little unsettling. To tell you. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I, I also have a GT500 and, you know, those cars are quite a bit heavier, right? Absolutely. Quite a bit more solid. So, you know, in a Fox, that sort of torque and everything and, and you know, the car's got a, you know, a cage and subframe connectors, but it still kind of moves around a little bit. Sure. And, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a bit like, you know, a go-kart with a, you know, Hayabusa. And <laughs> I'm not really sure, you know, <laughs> how far you want to push this thing, but when you do, it is a heck of a lot of fun. Right, and and that was one thing that I did want to talk about is you've obviously got Project Vapor Trail, which is your 08 GT500, yes, and then obviously the Fox. So you know, as and I'm guessing you guys are probably as hardcore Fox enthusiasts as I am, and you know, kind of the the whole purist thing. When you go when you go from one to the other, what's you know, what, what's your feelings on the car? Do you like the more raw, you know, uh, kind of unpolished feeling of the Fox? Or sometimes is it nicer just to get in the GT500 and kick the air on and cruise? Well, I, I'm a big fan of having all the creature comforts. You know, that was always something that I wanted to have in, in project cars, you know. But there there's, you can't, as much new stuff as you put in an old car, you can't make an old car feel new. Right. And But I think that there is that, it's it's a it's a what day you feel like driving that day you know what i mean it, it's uh you know there's sometimes you want to go back to that place where you were you know you had your fox first love and get in the car and feel those creaks and feel those you know that rough around the edges feel and and um but as far as the modern drive you know you can't replicate the modern driving experience of the glass smooth idle and the right. power and all the you know it's 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 a totally different experience but they're both great in their own way you know and there's you know foxes are where i i fell in love with the whole thing so it's it's nice to be able to you know kind of have a little bit of the of both worlds in that car absolutely absolutely so cage obviously you have the famous t-top coupe which i think in, in, in my opinion probably started the whole t-top craze um i remember when i first saw that car in the magazine and i remember all my buddies all of a sudden we're scouring craigslist <laughs> and the corral oh my god i'm gonna find myself a t-top coupe that thing is unreal cool um talk about the t-top coupe a little bit um well caleb uh the t-top coupe it, a, a T-top coupe in general um, what had, had been in my head for many, 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 many years. Um, my first Mustang was a T-top car. My gray Mustang was a T-top car. And I'll, I'll put this on the record. I've said this many times. I'm technically not a T-top guy. And I've had several T-top cars beyond the coupe. It's just a matter of good deals coming my way. So sure, you know, sure. go ahead and pick them up. But I really did not like T-top cars very much. However... Um, where I grew up, uh, in the area where I grew up, and when I got into Mustangs, there was a guy, and I will say his name, his name is Mike Resta. Mike Resta worked at an auto parts store, and he owned the first T-top coupe I ever saw. Wow. And, and th this is going back, gosh, to the early 90s. It was, he had a, it was an 85 or an 86, I think it was an 85, I believe it was carbureted. But um, it was a T-top coupe, it was the, like the car I have now, and right. I could not believe that you know, did you make that yourself? I mean, I went through the whole, <laughs> that, that doesn't exist. You couldn't have got a dealership, the whole thing. Um, but Mike owned one, and uh, I moved on in life, And but it just stayed in my head. Like, there's a T-top coupe out there. And it, you'd sit around with Mustang guys or whatever, and you're bench racing and that kind of thing. And you, you guys ever seen a T-top coupe? Ah, oh, there's no such thing as a T-top coupe. Are you kidding me? Oh, you, you know, you're crazy. And then, as I said earlier, with the internet coming about, and you're on forums discussing, and you just... Type something like that. I remember, I, I you know, in a forum, yeah. So there's a T-top coupe. No way, you're crazy. You don't know anything. You know what the heck are you talking about? Um, but go to the internet and on uh, it was hardcore50.com, um, one of the popular sites back in the day. Uh, a guy posted, um, I have this car for sale, and I looked and I was like, you got to be kidding. You know, like no way. Right. No way. And he happened to live in California. It just it just worked out. So I I mean I messaged him right away and you know blah blah blah. blah. I got to get this car. Let's just make it happen. 
he happened to be on vacation. I had to wait for him to get back from vacation. I was like, do not give this car to anyone else. And I let Steve know about it. And Steve was like, oh, no way. There's no such thing as a T-Tow crew. What are you crazy? <laughs> and to, to go on the record, I am a T-Top guy. <laughs> the 82 GT with T-Tops was the car that really put me down this path. So, uh-huh. you know, I had always wanted to get a T-Top car. So when he started talking about getting this, I was like, that's cool, you know. <laughs> you know, so I was all on board with this, this yeah. T-Top thing. Yep, I, um, I, anyway, I loaded up my, my trailer, took my truck and trailer out. I, I drove a collective, uh, and this is still in the state of California, but I had to go to the edge of California to pick the car up. So a collective 400-some-odd miles on the road mm. to pick the coupe up, and, and it was... It was it was what it was, but it wasn't ready for uh, public consumption <laughs> immediately. But we hatched the plan. Um, you know what can we do with this? And Hot Rod Magazine had its Drag Week program. Uh, that was one of the I think it was the first years when I got the car. I thought it'd be a cool idea to kind of build it around Drag Week, where it's a car that you can get in and drive and be comfortable, bust the full interior and stereo and you know all the things that it has in it. Yet. Um, at the time, the goal was some, somewhere in the area of 650 horsepower and, uh, you know, have some fun with it. But it was a learning process. You, you build the car and, and you're, you're coming along and discovering things. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden, your plan becomes another plan. And that becomes another plan. And that becomes sure. another plan. That becomes another plan. And what was really cool was, like you're saying, um, the internet and, and Mustang enthusiasts reading 5.0 embraced that project. They really did. And, and I would see people at events and stuff and, hey, did you bring the coupe with you? <laughs> like, like, really? You know, it was kind of cool. And it still is cool, actually, to, uh, in a sense, have, have a, a car, own a car and have put together a car that's like a real legacy in this game. I mean, a lot of people have said that. And it's sort of difficult for me sometimes to, to grasp it because I'm not really that 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 dude but people sure. really really do come out and, and they appreciated that whole building project and uh, I'm, I'm very happy about that i think it's worth noting though that there there was some pushback on both of our cars from the purest types because they're they are somewhat rare vehicles right mm-hmm. and we yeah. did some pretty radical things to these <laughs> rare vehicles <laughs> but you know I, being that we were both passionate about the Fox cars, you know, we we tried to, you know, we kind of called, you know, Fox rotting, you know, like exactly. We, we wanted to push forward the Fox into, you know, keeping it alive and and having people do these more, you know, outlandish things, you know, to and not just let them run into the ground and right. and you know go by the wayside. So you know that was part of our mindset as well to try to keep the car alive and vibrant as a as a project vehicle. And as, as the industry goes, uh, both projects, uh, the Coupe First and then Steve's project, um, those projects kind of push the industry into um, developing new products. There are several pe- several features on, on T-Top Coupe that, hey, why don't you guys do this? I think that, that Fox Mustangs are still viable enough for you to invest in producing this you know, component. And in a sense, you know, through the magazine, if they read it, they will come. You know, and there were several pieces on, on T-Top Coupe that spawned, you know, uh, I mean, the, the, the um, Fab 9 for Fox that was mocked up on T-Top Coupe. Oh, wow. And Chris Olsen's chassis works went on to sell, you know, quite a few of those rear ends and uh, basically the whole rear suspension package that was mo- literally mocked up on the car up at, uh, up at their facility in Sacramento. So we um, kind of made policy with both of them also, which is kind of neat. Which goes back to what you're saying, you know, as car guys, like to have the opportunity to sort of work hand in hand with the aftermarket and 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 help them, you know, that's always kind of your dream when you're sitting back at home. Absolutely. Like, like I wish they would make this. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And then when you present this car and like, hey, why don't you guys make this? And then they actually do it. Mm-hmm. It's like, <laughs> how cool is that? Right. Yeah. You know, and it's funny that you bring up the uh, the term fox rod because if I'm not mistaken, you all kind of coined that. We did. We did. There was a car uh, that we had put on the cover that uh, Chicane had built out in With California. Ferrari wheels. Had the Ferrari wheels on uh-huh. it. And, you know, uh, one of the challenges, as KJ, I'm sure, can still attest to uh, being a magazine editor is, is what we used to call writing your cover blurbs, right? Mm-hmm. You always had to come up with these catchy, you know, terminology right. yes. to, to sort of boil down what was in the magazine and make people want to 
to to read it and and when I saw that car that was just what came into my head it mm-hmm. was like that you know this is this isn't a hot rod this is a fox rod you know exactly and, this, and I saw that as the beginning of of something as far as you know these cars not just becoming an old like an old Mustang but as a viable like a modern right. car that you could push yeah. forward and because they're so flexible in what you can do to those cars you know they're your choices are pretty much endless as far as where you can take a fox. You still think you didn't trademark it, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's what's so awesome is is you saw spring out of that, you know, cars with incredible innovation and people, you know, started taking a second look at them and, you know, doing the, you know, like the, the GT500 swaps, doing the big brakes, um, you know, the IRS swaps, you know, all those other things, you know, and, and doing the interior um, to the level that Chicane did that car. I mean, I, I think that car inspired, um, you know, not just the new terminology, but, you know, the way that car was built, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, really inspired people to, you know, take a second look and say, this is an easy entry car that can be made, you know, that you can you know, go to the moon with or not. Right. And, uh, you know, they're not just, you know, a track or for a better, you know, lack of a better term, you don't slap drag lights yeah. and a nitrous express kit right. on it, right. you know, do something, do yeah. something different and yeah. cool. Something that's faster than a Porsche out handles a Ferrari, you know, that I paid 2,500 bucks on the outset for or yeah. the inset for. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's awesome that you said that. Cause that's what I wanted to, to kind of segue into was, you know, that car that Chicane Sport Tuning built. You know, I, I, I read that magazine several times because I was just blown away um, at the level of detail and, you know, even like the, the Ferrari level carpet they put yeah, inside the car. It was a game changer. Yeah. It, it, it was insane. And um, so, yeah, that that's awesome that you brought that up. Um, so as far as, you know, I think the industry is is kind of changing. You know, obviously the, the Fox body has is has been kind of reignited. Um and, you know, they're, they're everywhere and it, you know, the industry's kind of branched off into several different areas. Now you've got the, um, you know, the 15s obviously are out and any new Mustang that comes out, it's going to be a hot item, you know, it's going to be a big deal and you're going to have that following. Um, you know, so I, I think it has kind of split, you know, it, it seemed like to me, and, and I want you guys to kind of weigh in on this, you know, that there was a late model Mustang, um, following and now it's kind of gotten, you know, split off a little bit. The Fox guys, um, you know, are doing their own thing in, in many different ways. And then you've got the new 15 cars. Um, but, you know, it, as far as what you see the industry doing um, going forward, what's your thoughts, KJ? Um, it's interesting, uh, Caleb, because it, it, professionally, um, transition for me happened just as S550 was, was coming out. Right. And, um, you know, that was a bit of a, of a bruiser for me, it was a bit of a shock for me and a disappointment that I won't be, I, I looked at it as I won't be able to, you know, immerse myself into those cars like I did with Fox or, you know, with New Edge and stuff like that. So I was just telling Steve the other night, you know, sometimes a car will go by me or a new car, especially being here in Bowling Green, it's like, man, you know, that's a nice Mustang, it's a 15 or whatever. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's one of those type of deals. Um, but, um, I think the industry is, is still moving forward in a, in a positive direction. Um, companies are, are embracing S550 and you know figuring the car out. Of course, it's it's uh, night and day different in a lot of ways to Mustangs that preceded it with the uh, the IRS and some of the uh, other nuances that they put in the chassis of the car and such. But uh, going forward, I, I believe that Mustang is still going to be strong. It's funny or interesting that you noted. Uh, there are now factions of, of Fox, uh, SN95, New Edge, S197. It's not a collective Mustang enthusiast or, or Mustang guy, if you will, versus I have an S550 or I have an S197. You know, the, the, the whole group that doesn't come together like it used to. It's definitely um, sectionalized. But I think despite that, um, I would say Ford is still pretty strong on the car. You know, the 50 year came and, and that was a big celebration and it looked as, it looks as though they have all intents to uh, continue with the brand. So I think everything uh, is, is looking up right now. Absolutely. Steve, what's your thoughts? You know, where, where's the industry going? 
Well, first of all, I don't think the that stratification is really that new. You know, when I started on Super Ford, I was kind of the punk kid that was pushing to do more Fox Mustangs in a magazine that had a bunch of galaxies and all this stuff. And, and the old school Ford guys really were like, oh, we don't want anything to do with this new Fox Mustang, you know. So then we had that long stretch of, you know, Fox had a nice long run, so everyone was one big happy family there. But right. every, every era has its, you know it's fan base and they they all kind of stick together just like if you go to a car show like the guys with the vintage mustangs don't really associate with the guys with the you know s197s there's always been kind of that clicky nature to it but uh, you know i think it's it's as kj said it's you know it's still going forward in a really positive direction i think that the the 2015 mustang has uh it's appealed to both guys that have Mustangs and it's brought a, a, a whole new crowd into the car as as kind of each generation has and they've made the car better and more refined and it's it's attracted a new customer and I think the newer cars are more of a it's more of a bolt-on crowd at this point right it's a it's a pricey car so you're not going to get too crazy I, th- I think the, uh, the 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 realm of the project car if you will is, is still like a Fox Mustang is this right for the picking but you know I kind of see the s one s 187 era as as a potential newer Fox you know type of approach because those cars are there was a long run of them you know there, there's a lot of parts and and they're becoming more affordable to use as a basis for a project car as well yeah I gotta agree with you there and a lot of the reason is um, you know Mustang guys are pretty much uh, stick axle fans you know we do a lot of drag racing um, stuff like that very resistant to the IRS I think for a while there, the uh, the Terminators were probably one of the most uh, popular upgrades was putting a stick axle on the right. car. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's funny that you said that because the 11 to 14s, you know, they had the 5 so they had the power, and they still had the stick axle, and they were the last. So, you know, th- those cars are probably going to end up being, I think, a lot like the Foxes, um, you know, because they were light, they had good power, um, so on and so forth. So, yeah, that's... That's cool that you bring that up because I, you know, you already see on the web people talking about breaking axles and wheel hop and the S five fifties and, you know, obviously they're sweet cars, but um, I think it was American Muscle that did the video where the stock fourteen beat the stock fifteen, right. and everybody's like, "Wait a minute, <laughs> that's not cool." <laughs> and uh, you know, because I, I don't know if uh, KJ, if you ever saw the rumors that the S five fifty was actually supposed to be lighter than the S one ninety seven. Um, no, I can't say that I'm, you know, I'm familiar with, uh, with that data, Caleb, but I wouldn't, uh, I don't think I'd challenge it. I think that, uh, you know, as those cars go because of the difference in the, you know, the suspension and, and, and the axles basically in the, the, the back of the car that, uh, you would think that the, the components would be a little bit lighter. Sure. Sure. Did you ever hear anything about the... I saw that, but I didn't think it was really, I don't know where it came from. That's the, you know, it, it seemed to become this concept, uh, you know, out there on the internet that, you know, the car was going to be lighter. Maybe because that Ford had talked about lightening the F-150, someone made, you know, you know how it is. A right. lot of things on the internet, people would just put out a headline to grab, you know, attention. <laughs> and it's not necessarily always based in fact, but then it becomes, you know, the perception becomes the reality, you know. If you look at the Terminator, you know, those cars were a lot heavier than a GT because IRS components are typically heavier than a you know, solid axle. So Absolutely. it stands the reason that the, the new car, plus all of the gadgets and you know, safety they have to put in, that it's probably going to be a little bit heavier. You know, I know they worked to get as much weight out of the packaging as they could on the 2015 Mustang, but you know, you, you're still adding components in. So you know, I, I don't know where it came from, but I think it was a little bit misguided. I think people set themselves up for a disappointment for no reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so, guys, I'm getting getting close to wrapping this up. Um, you know, uh, Steve, what's your what's your plans going forward? Well, I'm I'm gonna. You can find me at svtperformance.com, and uh, you know, I'm I'm providing uh, coverage of. You know, a lot of news, of course, but, uh, you know, we still do features and, and uh, you know, drive reports. I recently drove the Shelby GT350 at nice. Laguna Seca, so you could read about that there. So I, I post pretty much every weekday, you know, several times, and, uh, you know, please come by and check it out. 
All right, so you can connect with him at svtperformance.com. If you hadn't signed up, huge community over there. Definitely check that out. Um, KJ, how can we keep up with you? Oh, uh, you know, again, I'm in a different space now working with uh, Diesel Power, but you can catch up with me through trucktrend.com and, uh, of course, Diesel Power Magazine. And from the Mustang perspective and the Fox perspective, uh, you know, I'm still a Fox guy, still a Mustang guy, will always will be. And, uh, you know, just, just doing my thing kind of privately now. You know, T-Top Coop is, is still in the garage, and, and as far as I know, it's not going anywhere. Um, so when it, uh, it's out in Southern California primarily, but if you see me and, and, and see the car or whatever, don't hesitate to, to check it out. I, I appreciate everyone's, uh, everyone's appreciation of that car. It's really, it means a lot to me. Absolutely. Now, is your wife still driving the black pro-charged edge car? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> How's it running? The car is running fine. I mean, after we, there were a lot of bugs in that project. Uh, I can't say that there weren't. That car fought, fought me and several other talented people for a long <laughs> time. But um, once we got it sorted out, uh, it's been literally a, a beast that is going to Steve's point earlier. Um, it's a new edge, so it has more, a little more comfort and, and um, pleasantries than a Foxwood, um, but it's not quite an S197. Uh, but it, it's it's a rocket ship, and we do it's it's regulated now more to a Sunday drive than than a daily drive. But it, it makes gobs of power, and uh, it still gets a lot of looks. And that's another one that's in the driveway, pretty much. Absolutely. Forever. And of course, Steve, Project Vapor Trail it just uh, just got some new wheels via a little bit of a spin out on the. Yeah, yeah, she's she's back to full strength. Looks better than ever, and you know it's still a blast to drive. You know. Makes about 700 at the wheels and, you know, drives like a charm, you know. Love it. Love it. Well, guys, I, I definitely wanted to uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity here in Bowling Green, um, here at the World Finals, kind of the culmination of the of the drag racing year and um, to, to sit down and, and just talk cars, talk Mustangs and, uh, um, you know, let everybody hear kind of what uh, what your background is and all the all the secrets in the industry and, um, but again, I wanted to thank you for coming on the Foxcast and, uh, you know, hope to stay in touch and, uh, maybe do this again sometime. Thank you, Caleb. It's been great. It's been fun. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you very much for having us and, and good luck with the Foxcast.